Welcome from the First Presbyterian Church in Burbank. We're glad you're here. Let's join the service now and hear the proclaiming of God's Word. The scripture this morning is from the book of 1 Samuel, the first chapter, verses 1 through 20. Now, uh, a few months ago when I was thinking about sermon texts and themes, I thought, what would be a good one for Mother's Day? And I came upon this one about Hannah and her life. Hannah, to me, is an inspiration. In fact, the scripture that Hannah actually prays in chapter 2, my heart rejoices in the Lord, and the Lord my strength is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. The prayer goes on, and it sounds exactly or close to what Mary prayed in the New Testament. And so Hannah becomes a model for Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I just thought, you know, what a woman of faith. So let's take a look at her today. We see the book of Samuel. It is a book about uh, God's working in Israel. But it's bigger than that because it's about God working in our lives as well. In fact, the word Samuel, Shmuel in Hebrew, means God has heard. And so in the book, we'll also find how God hears us, but we'll find that Samuel hears from God. And so I would uh, encourage you, if you ever want to know how is God speaking to us today or how can we hear God, read the book of 1 Samuel and you'll learn uh, how God speaks to us. So I like this text. Let's take a look at Hannah's life, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elchanah, son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. Well, now that you're clear on who that is, let's read on. (laughs) He had two wives. One was called Hannah, the other Penina, and Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking at Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Well, I'll tell you, uh, when I put that down as the text a few months in advance, I thought, oh, this would be a great one. Hannah is a great example of a woman of faith. And then as I read the scripture this week before, I went, oh my gosh, there's a lot of explaining to do about what's happening here. It's a very difficult text. I've taught this text many times, but I don't know if I've preached from the pulpit on it. it. It, to me... One of the themes that we see between Hannah and Eli, I mean, we have many characters in this story, and we'll look at some of them, but one of the themes is how Hannah is a woman of deep spiritual faith. I love Hannah. She inspires me. 
She calls upon the Lord and she bears her soul before the Lord and the Lord answers her. And another character in the story is a man named Eli. And what we know of Eli is that he is the priest, the high priest in the tabernacle. This is a very ancient story. This is a story before the Jews actually made the temple in Jerusalem. This is that ancient. And we find that Eli, on the other hand, though, is, well, he's a man of outward spirituality, but he's got problems with obeying the Lord. The high priest. And so one of the themes we see is the difference between deep spiritual faith and outward religious Many years ago, and you may have read this in the paper in Long Beach, a man drove through a fast food chicken restaurant uh, with his girlfriend. When they reached the window, he paid, and he was given a bag from the drive-through window, and they drove off, and a few blocks away, as they opened up, he and his girlfriend opened up the bag, they realized it was filled with money. Somehow, the store manager had put money in one of the bags, and instead of getting the bag of the chicken, which they ordered, gave him a bag of money. Well, the man knew what he had to do. And so he drove back to the store. He and his girlfriend went inside and gave the money, gave the bag back to the manager. And the manager said, wow, you are the most honest man I have ever met. He thanked one another. He thanked him. And the other man and his girlfriend began leaving the restaurant when all of a sudden the manager said, no, 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 don't go. Don't go. We've already called the newspapers. They're coming here to take your photo of the two of you and, and write a story on your honesty. The man said, oh, no, please don't do that, because if my wife finds out I'm with this woman. (laughs) Maybe you read that in the paper. Such a fine moment of honesty ruined by dishonesty. That's kind of the theme that we're looking at in Samuel. What we'll find from Samuel as he grows up, the son of Hannah and Elkanah, is that he is a true man of God. He is, what you see is what you get. He's a man of integrity like his mother was a woman of integrity. And so we see the theme of outward religion versus deep inward and outward religion. We long for the real thing, don't you? I long for the real thing, complete honesty and perfect truth. And when we see the real thing, we find it inspiring. When it comes to faith, we desire a deeply spiritual one, not just an overtly religious one, but one that has integrity inside and out. And so we see the contrast between Hannah and Eli. And what we find out is that Eli, while Hannah is filled with deep faith, Eli is outward spiritually is spiritual as the high priest of the tabernacle at Shiloh. An ancient story. But Eli has a problem. And as we read the book of Samuel, what we find out is that Eli has two sons named Hophni and Phinehas. We just read about them. Now these sons are priests in the temple. And it becomes very clear that they don't really have a calling from God to be priests. This is a bit of nepotism, if you will. And we find out that these two men are stealing from the offering. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, are stealing from the offering. And when the women come to the temple, they find find a way to go and have sexual relations in the temple with them, in the tabernacle with them. It's disgusting. It's impure. Eli begins to note that these things are happening and one by one prophets of God come to Eli and they say, Eli, you need to take care of this. Your priests are going wayward and not only your priests, they're your sons. Do something about it. And Eli refuses. Doesn't do anything at all because he has an outward spirituality as the high priest of the tabernacle, but inside he just doesn't have commitment to God. We find out in the story, if you read through the book of Samuel, that both Hophni and Phinehas and Eli will die tragic deaths. They don't listen to God. And there we find religion. But refreshing as it is, we find Hannah, who is religion. True religion. What a beautiful woman she was. She's married to a man named Elkanah that we read about. The word Elkanah in Hebrew means God is purchased or God owns, God possesses. In fact, many of the Hebrew words that are found of the names are, tell you a bit about their character. God possesses Elkanah. He's a good man. He loves his wife, Hannah, and he takes care of her. Of course, it's easy to wonder, well, why did he have two wives then? Penina, what about this other wife? But we put this in an ancient context of a very ancient story in the old world. What we find out in Judaism, both from the Mishnah and the Midrash, Yavamot 6, verse 6 
in those days actually said, look, if your wife is barren and doesn't bear a child for you within 10 years, you need to get another wife to bear children so you can fulfill the commandment to be fruitful and multiply. That's not our interpretation today. Just want to make that clear. But that's the context of what Elkanah is trying to do. And he has children with this other wife and she becomes a thorn in the side. But Elkanah and Hannah were godly people. They became the parents of one of the most important prophets that we have ever known in history, Samuel, Shmuel. God has heard. Shmuel, Samuel, as a little boy, will begin to hear God. And thus you see the difference with with us hearing God and how to hear from God and God hearing us and play on words. And Again, I want to encourage you, if you want to know how to hear from God, read the book of Samuel. You'll learn some things about how God listens to those who are righteous. I believe that Hannah and Elkanah were godly parents, and Eli, though he's outwardly religious, Samuel will grow up in an atmosphere of both church and godly parents. How beautiful that is. I would dare say that the most important thing we can do for children is to bring them up in the Lord's presence as godly parents and bringing them to the family of faith to experience the beauty of the people of God. I remember the lessons my parents taught me and I think of, in fact, we're told in verse 3 of 1 Samuel that year after year, Elkanah and Hannah went to the tabernacle to worship God and be with the people of God. We find out in Luke, the second chapter, first or second chapter, that Jesus and his parents brought, his parents, Mary and Joseph, brought him to the people of God and desired to raise him in the faith. And I think of my parents. My parents never forced me to go to church. They just knew, I just knew it was their value. I know from an early age, when I was a little boy, we would go to church because that's what the Purdy family did. And I loved the values that they had so much that when I was a teenager, even without them pressuring me, I wanted to be in church because that's what my parents did. They raised that me with that example. Now, to be sure, there were times when I didn't go to church. There were a few years where, where I didn't have anything to do with church. But I'll never forget in my life how important it was for me to set that as a practice, to see my parents practicing that so I could learn that too. What I want to say this morning is God bless you for being here. My parents taught me a lot about faith. They They dedicated me to God and in baptism they said, all right, God, this is your son. There he is, you raise him. We'll do what we can, but God, help him mature and to become a man of God. The most important lesson my parents gave me was this that God is present with us all the time. I'm not sure I would have understood that had my parents not acted that way and lived that way themselves. They, they taught me things about how God is providing for me, sustaining for me, and nurturing me to develop me into the person I'm becoming. And they told me this. They said, Ross, there are 168 hours in a week. Give God one of them. God takes care of us throughout the week in so many ways. In all ways, God is never sleeping with us. God is present and active. We're breathing in the presence of God. God is making our heart beat. God blesses us and gives us things. Ross, there are 10,080 minutes every week. Certainly you can give 60 of them to praise God. Ross, there are 604,800 seconds every week. Certainly you can give God 3,600 of them one hour. My one hour at church, they said, was not my time to receive. Though we all know the benefits we have by being in God's presence with God's people. The primary reason for taking the time was to worship God. God, you give us all throughout the week. We're setting aside time for you. My parents taught me that uh, we are preparing in this life to join the heavenly chorus, which will praise God forever. And that we need to learn how to do that. The song of all created beings is recorded in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, in which we hear all of creation, and we will hear this one day, I promise you. All of creation sings to God, Well done, Lord. You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive honor and glory and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You see, there's something about godly influences in our lives, isn't there? My parents taught me a lot about God. You teach me a lot about God. 
my mothers and my fathers, my brothers and my sisters. We learn about who God is by the influence we share together in worship of holy, uh, the holy and almighty God. My mother's faith, like Hannah, inspired me. I don't know how many times my mother prayed for me or my siblings in her life, but I'm sure that her knees much, must be damaged today because of her times on her knees in prayer for all of us. I didn't know, but now I do. I, I learned this later on in my life that my mother used to come to my bedside when, when, I, when we were asleep, our children, one by one, and she'd go in and pray for us. I didn't know that. I was asleep. I didn't know that at 10 years of age when I had something that was very anguishing in my life, I was at a physical problem and my mother would come in every night. I went to the doctors. The doctor said, there's nothing we can do. We don't know how to fix this. But my mother used to come in every night when I was asleep. I didn't know till recently. And she'd pray over me and say, God, we have a problem. How do we fix this? And I remember going back to the doctors. The doctors looking at me and saying, there's no explanation for this. My mother probably thinking, yeah, there is. <laughs> because that's authentic faith. It's a faith that doesn't have to tell everybody everything. But you just live it before the Lord. My mother had authentic faith, has authentic faith, my father too, and in some way they remind me of Hannah, who, who dared courageously to kneel down before the tabernacle and just pray and pour her heart out to God, even though a priest said, stop it, woman, you're sinful. She didn't care. I'm not sinful. I'm pouring out my heart to God. And we have that contrast between Hannah and Eli. But when you meet Hannah you know you've seen the real thing. And it's life-changing. It's the religion of Jesus. It's no wonder Jesus changed lives. Because when people saw him, they said, that's what I've been looking for. That's what I want. He's living faith with God. He, he is walking this life in complete faith to God. And he's not outwardly religious. He's outwardly and inwardly religious and spiritual. And when we find the real thing, oh, we desire it. But Hannah's faith was not easy. She was ridiculed and harassed by Panina. She was provoked to depression. Look again in the scripture. It says, she did not eat and wept constantly. It's depression. She was rejected and scorned even by the high priest Eli. He judged her and said, how long are you going to stay drunk, woman? Put away your wine. How easy it was for Eli to scold a woman who was trying to seek the Lord when he would not take care of his own children. How judgmental he was toward her when his own sons were doing the same thing, doing worse things. I would say religious hypocrisy. I hate that. Don't you hate religious hypocrisy? It is the most offensive thing of all to, the, to God and to this world, religious hypocrisy. Why? Because we all can see it and we all know it. But God bless the person who says, okay, I may have hypocrisy in my life, but I'm trying. And I'm going to let the Lord God be worshipped and praised outwardly and inwardly. That's Hannah. And the Lord answered her prayer for a child. Now, I know that Hannah's experience is not a lesson about how to get an answer from the Lord. It's not. Chapter 1. Because what I do know that there are, is this. There are women today who have wept and cried aloud for a child and God didn't answer their prayers. And their prayers may have been just as holy as Hannah's. And I don't understand why God doesn't answer all prayers. I, I, don't, I don't get it. But I know that God can. And for those women who might on Mother's Day be reminded of something they don't have, may God be with them. Because I do know this with all of my heart. Mother's Day can bring up feelings of pain and sorrow for some, but I know this to be true. God weeps with us. I don't understand why God doesn't answer all prayers. But in our story, he answered Hannah's prayer. And she became pregnant by Elkanah. And I love that name that she gave her son, Samuel, Shmuel. God has heard. You see, that's another thing that I've learned from my parents is that God is always present with us. God always hears. God doesn't give us all we want. God doesn't answer every prayer that we make. But God always hears. And the way it's meant in this passage is not that God just hears it and it goes 
through, you know, one ear to the other if God has ears, but that God hears and does something about it. That's hearing. That's the God of Samuel. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what sorrows or pains you might have in your heart. I don't know how God will answer, or maybe God will answer by not answering. But I can know that God hears. And I also know God from the Bible especially hears the prayers of the righteous, the godly. Not the hypocrites, not the Eli's, but God answers the prayers of the Hannah's and the Jesus's and the Samuel's and you. Hannah poured out her heart to God. She bared her soul to the Lord. She didn't flippantly ask God to answer her prayers. She shared her heart with him. In her groans and tears, God inhabited that space. When we become vulnerable to the Lord, we allow him to enter our situations and work in our lives. And the outward religion will never do, never do. Deep inward faith will be the vehicle the Holy Spirit uses to connect us to the Almighty. Now let me say this. Inauthentic, outwardly religion is the enemy of God. Outwardly, inauthentic religion is the enemy of God. Now, I know the Bible says that Jesus has destroyed all enemies. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. But we're also told in the scriptures that up until the very last moment when Christ comes, 2 Timothy, that people will have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. In other words, the way of sin in the world will look like religion without power. But God bless those who decide to be like Jesus and say, no, no, no. My religion, my spirituality, my faith will be one that is authentic and powerful because I don't keep the Lord out of my insides. God is with me, permeating my body, soul, and spirit. Again, inauthentic religion is the enemy of God. It pretends to worship the Lord, but instead it keeps people from the Lord. That was true during Jesus' day, wasn't it? There was a religion, but it didn't do anything. And Jesus came, and he healed the sick and raised the dead and fed the, fed the hungry and gave to the poor. That was authentic religion. I want my life to be one that shows Hannah's faith, don't you? I want to know the God who hears, Shmuel. I want to know the God that, I want to hear God, Shmuel. I want to know the power and presence of God's love because I don't have time for inauthentic things anymore. Do you? I'm tired of the fake and the plastic stuff. I want to know the real thing. And the more that I learn about the real thing, the more that I see it's Jesus, it's Hannah. It's Samuel. There's a beautiful scripture, one of my favorite scriptures in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. It says, The eyes of the Lord are searching all over the earth right now to find those hearts that are committed to him that he can show his strength in. I love that scripture because it tells me, wow, if I become committed to God, God can possess me. I don't mean that possess. I mean, God can have me. Elkanah, I belong to God. And God, I want your strength to be shown in me and in our lives. That's what authentic power is all about. It's being committed to God. But it's even more so in this sense because the two things I realize about Hannah's life are number one, she pours out her heart in truth to God. And the heart of God is that he gives her a child to raise up in the faith. Somehow I believe those are the two most important things for our lives. To be truthful before God. To live in truth. And to take care of the children. Jesus made it clear in his ministry, remember? The disciples were pushing the crowds back and, and then the children came. Jesus, uh, the, the disciples said, no, 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 he doesn't have time for you. And Jesus said, stop. Let the little children come unto me. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. Let the little children come unto me. Hannah understood that God was to be worshiped and praised. God is the one to whom we turn. And then now God would give her someone she could mentor and give back to the world. Shmuel, God hears. The famed and popular 
Danish writer Hans Christian Andersen. I was raised on his children's stories. Were you? Hans Christian Andersen rested uh, his fairy tales written over a period of 37 years, translated in many different languages. Andersen knew at the end of his life this one fact, that the children of the world loved him. And late in his life, as he was preparing for death, he turned to a musician. He said, I want you to write the music for my funeral. He said, but here's what I want you to do. Most of the people, he said, who will walk after me will be children, so make the beat keep time with the little steps. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, may our lives be a musical selection that keeps in time with the little steps. That's what Jesus was saying. Children are important. I believe that we can please the Lord by coming together and worshiping the Lord and by mentoring the children to be the future generations. I love the image of a professor in the 16th century who would come into class every day. The first thing he would do was the students were sitting there as he'd walk in, he'd come and he'd bow to them. The news that the professor was bowing to the students came to the dean. The dean called him in and said, What are you doing? You're turning things upside down. That's not how the way, this is not how it works. The students are supposed to stand and bow to you, their professor. The professor said, I'm sorry, but I won't stop this tradition. I will come in every day and I will bow to the students because I'm not bowing to children that are sitting in front of me. I'm bowing to the children for whom they will become. I don't know who's sitting in my classroom and I'll show them respect. One young student heard about the professor's words and was so deeply touched that his mentor would bow to him that it had a great impact on his life. His name was Martin Luther, who almost single-handedly turned the world upside down through the Protestant Reformation. Imagine what we could do if we on this Mother's Day decided, women and men, we're going to be mothers to the children of this world. We're going to give them shoes. Because no child should be without shoes, amen? We're going to give them our lives. And we're going to show them what this real faith looks like. That it's not a man who sits by the door and goes to church on Sunday and judges other people. Woman, you're drunk. But it's a woman who comes to the tabernacle and cries out to God and says, God, I need you. I don't know how to do this. You've given me a desire for children. Bless me. And the Lord gave her a child who would change the world, Shmuel. A sign that God hears us and we can hear God today. May God make us all mothers, amen. And God bless you mothers for the hard work that Kathy said you're doing. You are doing, it's hard work. But it makes an eternal difference, amen. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you so much for your love in our lives. We thank you that children are important. You said, let the little children come and forbid them not. Jesus, you love the little children. Help us to see that we are children, that that as we grow in this world, learning how to worship you forever, that we can pause to take one day, one hour of a day in a busy week to say, God, thank you Thank you for all you've done. May our lives be authentic. May we be true people of faith so the generations that come beyond, behind us will ever be blessed. Bless us so we can bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you for Hannah. Amen. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. We also invite you to join us to worship in person on Sunday mornings. We have services at 9.15 and 11.15. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you.